broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Sharon Hewson here at AEE. I'd like to welcome you to today's AEE member webinar. Um, before we get started with introductions to the webinar itself, let me just go over our usual housekeeping issues. Just wanted to let you know that on your control panel, you have a questions section and a chat section. If you have technical issues that you'd like to notify me or just ask me questions on, please use the chat section. If you have questions for Mr. Griffey, our presenter today, please post those in the question section. The plan is to address all Q&A towards the end of today's webinar, so you may post questions at any time during the webinar, but please understand we'll address those at the end. Um, also, as always, you will receive a follow-up email after today's webinar. It will usually come out within the next 24 to 48 hours, which will include for you a link to the recording of today's webinar, plus a link to your certificate of attendance. So um, please be on the lookout for that. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our, our presenter for today. It's Mr. Bo Griffey, who is a ch client executive with Train. So Mr. Griffey is responsible for executive level energy account support, and this includes many functions. Sorry, flicking through that. Let me go back to this one here. Um, he monitors daily fundamental and technical factors that affect current energy markets. So also involving involved in assessing risk tolerance, recommending physical and financial purchase strategies, evaluating demand side management, renewable energy and other energy related sustainability improvement opportunities, and coordinating all other aspects of account fulfillment. Uh, Mr. Griffey has had a variety of experience having held a variety of positions at different public and private energy corporations, and his experience includes things like business development, consulting, mergers and acquisitions, sales, management, trading, startup commercialization, and sustainability. Bo recently completed an exit of a power generation optimization and analytics platform, taking a cons consulting business and transitioning it to a software business. He has developed a 50 megawatt pipeline of renewable energy and low emissions projects in the last few years. These technologies include biogas, solar, wind storage, and CHP. Bo is a certified energy manager and an energy proc procurement professional. He has a bachelor's degree in history from the University of Central Missouri and an MBA with emphasis in finance from Rockhurst University, Hellsberg School of Management. So thank you, Mr. Griffey, for being here with us today and for sharing your expertise with our members. And I'm going to go ahead and pass control over to you. Thank you, Sharon. Let me show my screen here. OK, does that look good? That's perfect. OK, excellent. Well, uh, thank you again, Sharon, for the introduction. And welcome, everyone, this afternoon uh, to the uh, presentation. And uh, we're going to go ahead and get started here and we'll take questions at the end. So we're going to talk about renewable energy and particularly hybrid solutions behind the meter uh, today. It will be our, our focus of interest. And uh, we presented this at AE West uh, in California several months ago and it was well received. So uh, uh, we're back again. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to we're going to talk about what is what are hybrids uh, and what does the market look like, size and type and adoption rates a little bit. Uh, why are they gaining in um, an interest, uh, particularly in microgrid interest? And a lot of utility challenges and inefficiency in the marketplace. Most of this discussion is going to be centered about around North America, specifically US, but uh, it has applicability internationally as well, just FYI. And cost and resiliency is another issue that uh, that comes up and, and why people are interested in, in microgrids. And we'll talk about when is a good time to implement them, give you a sort of a checklist of things to consider and facility types that uh, that make sense, and then how to get them done, uh, which typically involves some form of finance uh, as well as engineering. But the engineering can be done, anything can be built, is how do you pay for it? So uh, those are some of the things we're going to talk about here today. First up is, is what is it? Uh, and so primarily, 
uh, renewable energy systems, on-site hybrid systems are generation. It's behind the meter generation. Uh, it could be either a single building or it can be a complete campus, uh, either in a university setting or hospital setting or a district, district energy setting. Uh, so that's, it involves a lot of different technologies. Uh, there's, a, there's a number of technologies that are available now to uh, building operators and industrial facilities around the globe. They're tried and true, they're not new. Uh, it's just how do you combine those to make them work for you? And among those are solar PV, which I'm sure most of you are probably familiar with, combined heat and power or tri-generation, you know, where you're, uh, I think you're gonna see a growth in this particular market. It's prime for um, sites that have heat load or steam requirements or hot water. Uh, the, the efficiencies on these units are significant and it can take over some baseload power generation. Uh, waste to energy, so there you're talking about biomass or biofuels, uh, biogas, which is also is landfill gas. Uh, this is a, an emerging sector that's really coming on strong, especially in the corporate space. It's, it's emerging as a lot of corporates are transitioning from the electric side, where they've done a lot of on and off site projects to uh, the scope one emissions or the thermal side of things, and how do we green that up as well? So, biogas is, is going to have a bright future ahead of us. And we're going to talk about tying it all together in a microgrid and a smart grid. Uh, of course, energy storage is, is a component that's very critical for that as well. And district energy systems, as we mentioned uh, up front, uh, and central utility plants are, are big players in this as well for campus systems and, and so on and so forth. Uh, wind and fuel cells kind of round out where we're at. So there's a, there's a large menu of uh, different options that you can combine behind the meter to increase resilience, provide a good ROI, and keep your plant running if there's issues going on, right? So, uh, and provide, meet your sustainability objectives. All right, so I always kind of lead presentations off with this particular slide. I, this is not any rocket science, but uh, uh, the most valuable unit of energy is the one you don't use and still get done the business you need to get done uh, in your economic engine, or whether that's producing a widget or a service or running a, a hospital, uh, taking care of patients or running a university campus or uh, you know, district heating or energy system in a, a metropolitan area or development. The most valuable unit of energy is the one you don't have to use and still get done what you've got to get done in your normal course of business. That said, the next two steps in that is the one you produce on site and the one you buy. And so the one you produce on site is the one is where we're going to focus most of our attention today is how can you get more renewables on site in a land constrained situation not a lot of rooftop space. How do you maximize your site specific uh, profile at a, at a certain location? Right? So we're gonna focus on that today. Of course, there's a lot of mechanisms on the one you buy. Uh, corporates have really adopted a lot of virtual agreements and other large scale deals. We're gonna focus behind the meter today. All right, a little bit of uh, market news and sort of the adoption. We're going to start with storage. Storage is uh, really coming on uh, similar on a similar curve to where solar was probably 10 years ago. And you can see here in 2012, uh, it was sort of incipient and it's really started to come on. It's projected by 2023 to be a uh, $4.5 billion uh, industry. I think we're going to eclipse that easily because uh, it's just wrapping up uh, even more um, rapidly. As, we, as, as more renewable adoption is coming on, more technologies open up, and really the cost of the, of the technology is dropping dramatically. And the same thing that happened with solar is going to happen with batteries. As you move up that scale on the hockey stick to the up and to the right, the economy of scale improves, so it just increases that adoption rate. And storage is a big piece of what ties the system together and can balance everything behind the meter. And we'll talk about how that kind of works in a little bit. 
some market data on microgrids and resiliency. You know, resiliency, number one, is kind of tough to quantify on what it means and what the value of resiliency is, but it's definitely uh, moving in that direction. You know, that I think about California and PG&E, uh, particularly in Northern California, where they've had a, a ton of rolling shutoffs this fall with uh, high winds and things. And uh, we have some hospital clients out there that have run backup generation for 40 or 50 hours at a time. And they, they've got to be able to serve patients. So to them, resiliency is uh, a very large component of what they would consider in a, in a payback on a microgrid, right? So they, they just have to be able to function. They're, they're key to the community in providing service. So microgrids are growing as a result of that. And you can see here the, the forecast at about a 20% uh, uh, North American compound annual growth rate for microgrids. I think adoption, you're really starting to see a lot of adoption for critical infrastructure like hospitals, schools, government facilities. You're seeing a lot of adoption as well on projects that are, say, at the end of the line. Um, the last mile of distribution to a facility is, is tough. Maybe it's constrained. You're seeing a lot of, a lot of corporates move in that direction uh, towards microgrids and taking control of their spend and their production. Okay, market trends in PV. Uh, you probably have all seen some chart to this, this basic effect, but uh, the PV growth has been dramatic and it's defied most uh, forecasters' ability to appropriately forecast the, the growth that we've seen in solar. Uh, and we're still projecting, with all the growth we've seen, at least a 15% compound annual growth rate through 2025. And I think that's probably conservative. Uh, it depends on where we're at, particularly in the U.S. on tariffs and some other things. But the interest in solar, especially as the wind tax credits uh, sunset this year, is continuing to increase. And we have a robust industry in this country, despite the tariffs. So they've seen kind of shrug those off, and we, we still see rapid growth there, both on utility scale and behind the meter. A lot of drivers behind that and the, the solar story um, and sustainability initiatives is, is certainly a key, uh, key component of that. It has favorable economics. It has even more favorable economics in some parts of the country where there's state incentives. Um, there's probably 15 states or so where solar's uh, a slam dunk, paybacks are you know, under two years, and their total rates of return are in the 20s. Um, and then there's other states where solar has to compete just on its merits and on the current tax exemption and or the tax credit. And so the, the payback in those areas is four to five years, but still pretty attractive uh, as a long-term investment. Okay, this is an interesting slide that I think we're gonna see a lot of growth in an area for CHP. Uh, if you look at this slide on the bar graph there, we've got some circles in red where you see the technical potential in gigawatts of CHP capacity. And the biggest one there is commercial buildings or other commercial buildings. There is a ton of capacity, in, particularly in the U.S., uh, to put in CHP where there is some heat load or just a, a recip engine or something if there's not a lot of heat load. And get it behind the meter and produce energy. And what I think is interesting about this, this slide and this potential is also combining that with biogas uh, and then maybe with some on-site solar and some other things. And we're gonna talk about that down the road here in a minute, but essentially there is a huge market that's been un relatively unexploited in the US for combined heat and power potential as this chart, this chart shows. Okay, uh, so why? Why is there interest uh, now and why haven't we seen more adoption uh, before on microgrids or more behind the meter, different hybrid solutions? And a big reason why is we have an aging distribution infrastructure. Uh, if you just look at, uh, go back to the PGE example uh, out in California, a lot of deferred maintenance out there, particularly on transmission and distribution systems. 
uh, not the main transmission on at the you know, the ISO or the independent system operator level, but the transmission and distribution network that the, the local distribution companies operate and maintain. There's just a lot of aging stuff out there that's not been properly maintained or just needs to be replaced and lacks funding to get it done. Uh, you've also got a lot of aging generation infrastructure that's starting to change over now. Uh, although, you know, see a lot of coal plant retirements, uh, there's a fight on in the Southeast to try to get some, some new nuclear plants built, but I think the, the cost overruns on that thing have been ridiculous. I'm not sure you're going to see a whole lot of new nukes built. And there's a lot of really old nukes in the country that, uh, that are still running and need to get either upgraded or mothballed, right? And so you're seeing a lot of renewables come in and replace some of that larger generation infrastructure, but it's not replacing it fast enough and it's not typically the base load, right? So it's, it's not like a coal plant or a new plant that's gonna come on and be your base load power. Uh, and then there's a changing demand profile. And so you'll see with, uh, familiar with the duck curve, which is down the chart down below here, and it looks like a duck. This is the typical situation in, in California where you have, uh, well, just in California in general has about 40% of the U.S. solar market share in and of itself. So there's a huge influx of solar, rooftop solar, utility scale solar, every kind of solar you can imagine in California. And what it's created is this bottoming out in the middle of the day uh, over generation risk, which essentially means there's there's more solar and other resources in the middle of the day uh, than is needed in the state, right? So you get this very deep uh, sort of trough that forms from between 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. And then when everyone comes home from work and solar's not producing as much, you see a very steep ramp up of about, you see that 13,000 megawatts in three hours that needs to take place and the market has a tough time reacting to that you've seen a lot of rate changes to react to this a lot of, a lot of time of use rates being implemented uh, where in the middle of the day your cost of energy is next to nothing but uh, during that ramp period between 5 and 9 p.m or 6 and 9 p.m your costs are significantly higher and that's a clear incentive to to curtail during that period or bring on more resources to cover that need, right? So uh, a lot of uh, electric vehicles play in there too. So the, the whole demand dynamic is changing with these renewables that are on the grid, right? And, and the proliferation of those. And they're non-dispatchable, right? So solar is not a dispatchable resource unless it's got a smart inverter or some other storage technology coupled with it that it, that it can dispatch. And so, Right in here on this duck curve is where you're also, this area right here, this three hours is where you're gonna see it, a lot of uh, storage implemented to address that right there. So combine this with this, you get to arbitrage the low price here with the really high price here, charge during this period and then discharge during this period. And uh, it makes a lot of economic sense. It's also a win for the owner. Um, everything's got to make financial sense. You can you can do this for the social and environmental benefit as well, but it, at the end of the day, it's got to make financial sense first, uh, and it's starting to pretty rapidly. And so, some of the key bullet points for the owner is is you reduce your operating cost. Uh, you provide. Or in, let me go back to reduce operating costs. So, if you're running a commercial building, if you're a commercial building owner and you reduce your operating costs, that increase your net operating income, right? So that's a double whammy there for those guys, right? So it's either reducing your operating income or providing a direct benefit to your bottom line, right? Or, or even the top line. Provide budget certainty. Uh, so typically renewables are a long-term investment. Certainly solar is a 25-year warrantied product that probably has a 30 to 35-year life. Not a lot of moving parts pretty reliable, uh, a lot of budget certainty with that kind of a product, right? So, and if you combine that with other renewables behind the meter, uh, you're pretty certain you, lock, you can lock in with great certainty what your cost is gonna be for several years out on the curve. Preserve your capital deposit uh, dollars 
And so we're going to get into some of this ownership models and, and whether you want to put out your own capital or you want to finance it. And it's new finance structures have been the single largest lever for the growth of renewables uh, in the country over the last 10 years. Financial products and the availability of financial markets to come in and finance these things have gotten deals done where you avoided the capital fist fight for dollars, right? So it's really allowed more to be deployed than was thought capable. Decrease your risk. Again, that goes up to budget certainty as well. Uh, support your sustainability initiatives. Uh, you can't address the utilities aging infrastructure, but you can certainly address your own behind the meter. And by doing this behind the meter, not only can it provide a benefit to your business, lower your operating cost, increase resiliency of your operation, but you can also provide a benefit back to the grid. So maybe they don't have to build as much transmission as they did previously uh, or add more capacity because you're offering a benefit, a grid benefit from your resource behind your meter, right? So uh, provide resilient, resiliency and redundancy we talked about and, and energy independence. I would say energy independence is kind of on the low end of things, but uh, it is a critical to some folks. So let's talk about when this makes sense and, and what to look for uh, in a site that you may have. So uh, if you answer, I put on here if you answer yes to any of the following, but realistically, if you answered yes to three or more of these, then you should be considering something soon, right? So. Uh, and the biggest is what are you paying for like electricity right now, right? So if your blended costs, meaning your energy and your demand are in the neighborhood of uh, a seven cents a KWH or $70 a megawatt hour uh, equivalent, you should be considering uh, behind the meter generation in some fashion. And uh, a renewable energy hybrid may make sense for you, right? So. Um, if you're concerned about the impact of future energy costs, right now you're a price taker and you want some control over that price in the future uh, and some cert and especially certainty about maybe your sustainability objectives and some other things, now is also a good time to think about doing that, right? Because it's uh, finances available and prices are good and there's savings to be had typically. Is your facility located in a deregulated market? So there's there's about 13 states in the United States that are deregulated for power. So you go out and shop from a third party uh, who you're going to buy your power from. And uh, there's the like UK is also another very open market. And there's a few other open markets. A lot of Europe is open. Um, but in the US, it's kind of choppy. You're either in a vertically in inter integrated utility regulated market, like I'm in in the Midwest or you're in an open market. And most of those are either in Texas and California to some degree with direct access and the Northeast. So if you're in a deregulated market, you may have more optionality than the next guy, but you still ought to be concerned about those market drivers, right? So uh, are you concerned about power reliability? So I, we kind of talked about the hospital uh, analogy previously. Those folks have to have power and they have to have it now. If you've got a production sensitive facility, we have to have power. You can't take flicker. You can't, you know, you can't have any reliability issues like that. This is something to consider as well, right? So um, do you have an existing central plant? So most district energy systems have a central plant. A lot of college campuses, university campuses have a central steam plant. Uh, if you have a central plant, you know, bolting on and adding to that and turning it into a renewable hybrid system is, is a little simpler than, you know, starting from scratch. Do you expect to replace or upgrade any plan equipment in the next three to five years? We, we talked previously about the utilities deferred maintenance. Um, that doesn't even stretch the surface of the wastewater treatment plants in this country and the deferred maintenance bill that they have. It's in the trillions of dollars. And, and they're already typically energy producers because they're, if they're, if they're digesting you know, sewage, they're producing biogas. Uh, so this is a, a way for them to take advantage of some of those things. If they, can, if, they, if, if they have to replace some equipment, why not replace it now, take the bite now, uh, maybe through a public-private partnership or some other structure, have somebody come in and finance it, put in a complete system and turn it in from an energy consumer to a net energy generator and resource for the grid. And, and 
while you're at it, you you solve your reliability issues, right? So another thing to consider, any expansion or new construction in the next three to five years, certainly if you're going to do a microgrid project and you know there's a expansion in the next five years, then you need to you kind of factor that into your plans, right? So and if you're going to do that, if you're already got capital budget dollars associated with that, then it may be an easier time to take a bite off of, of something of this nature. Uh, have you implemented energy efficiency measures? Uh, so we talked earlier on that previous slide about how the, the most valuable unit of energy is the one you don't use and still get done what you have to get done. The average building in this, in the U.S. anyway, wastes about 30% of its energy. Uh, so there's a needle to be moved there, and I would highly recommend you take energy efficiency as the first step. But so once you've exhausted that, and there's certainly a point of diminishing value on dollars into energy efficiency projects once you reach a certain segment, then it's time to consider the next step of what can I put behind the meter uh, combination of resources to, to improve my return, create that resiliency, energy independence, and, and price certainty on a go-forward basis. And are you interested in reducing your facility's impact on the environment? Again, this is the sustainability message. And the triple bottom line is really key to that, right? And the bottom line of the triple bottom line being the financial impact. The other two elements are the social and the societal environmental impact of, of, of these projects, right? Which can be significant and should not be uh, ignored, right? Because they can be significant PR wins, they can be significant price risk wins, and, and return, right? They can be financially attractive. So uh, it's good to take all those practical considerations into, into account. All right, when is a good time to be exploring these things? Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about targeted markets and programs that are sort of out there. So uh, sort of a pre-screening list of things for to, to, uh, to, to target markets and market act areas that are interesting is you look at the spark spread. And so that's the difference between that gas and, and power and what that spread is. And if it's a good spark spread, then it, gas generation behind the meter may make more, more sense, right? What are your local utility rates? You know, what's, how are they, how are they made up? Are, are they mostly energy, meaning KWH charges with very low demand charges? Or are they now start like most utilities, the demand of the fixed fees is starting to creep up to 50 plus percent of your bill where the energy, the KWH charges are dropping. And so that's typically how utilities are recouping a lot of their return on equity now is through fixed charges, such as demand fees, right? And so if you put in a hybrid system, if you put in a solar on your rooftop, right, it may affect your demand. It may not, depending on if a cloud comes over, it's a rainy day, whenever you peak, whatever the situation is. But if you put a hybrid system in addressing your demand spikes, then you can cover both sides of the bill and attack that and drive it down. Right, so it pays to understand your local utility rates, what they've been in the past, where you think they're going and where they're at right now, uh, to what potential technology combination you could put in place to lower those bills. Rebates and incentives, another huge one. Uh, rebates vary and incentives vary by state. There are some federal incentives. So the investment tax credit is the most common. It's a 30% tax credit uh, on the cost of a project off the top and in year one. And it applies to solar, wind. Uh, combined heat and power can get 10%, not the 30%. Uh, so there's, there's an ability to take a, a quick win there with the investment tax credit if you have tax appetite. If you don't, there's plenty of investors out there who would love to monetize that tax equity and, and sell you a PPA if you're in an area that allows that, right? So uh, next is a study uh, market potential and, and market penetration, right? So uh, what this means essentially is, is what is the penetration of microgrids and renewables and behind the meter projects in your areas? I mentioned previously that California is like 40% of the U.S.'s total share of the, the solar market very high distributed energy resource uh, allocation or, or penetration in that particular market. State of Kentucky, not so much, right? So know your market, know the, if, if there's a high penetration in some areas, chances are you got high accommodation of good incentives and high energy rates. 
And if there's low penetration in some areas, chances are you get low energy rates and very low incentive levels, right? So just look at your location and look at the market penetration within that location to kind of, kind of give you a little pre-screen on if it's feasible or not. And determine the technology with the highest probability. And, and what I mean by this is I always default first to solar because as we talked about it, it's a, it's a very long lived asset with not a lot of moving parts and it's going to sit up there passively and generate a lot of energy for you, a fair amount of energy for you over the period. But it's only going to do it when the sun's out and it's only going to do it between 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. in the summer and probably less than that in the winter. And so how do you address the rest of your 24 seven needs? Well, that's when you can look at matching it up with things like wind. And if you look at the, the profile of wind and match it to the profile of solar, what you'll find is, is when wind is peaking, it's typically in the evening hours or the shoulder months, which is the spring and the fall. And it dips during the day and then it comes back up in the, in the evening, right? So, and solar is peaking between nine and five. And so it fills in that, that gap, that shallow trough that, that wind leaves and you match that with solar and you have a much more base load looking project or pro uh, uh, energy production off that project, right? Now it's, it, they're both intermittent resources so you can't be guaranteed on both of those, but if you had solar and wind and you added a battery to that or you added a generator to that behind the meter, then now you've got the, the makings of a microgrid, you just need a controller to control all that and, and dispatch all those resources at the appropriate time. I just visited a, a, a facility in Tucson. It's a Caterpillar facility that's completely off grid and they have a working microgrid there. They have solar, they have uh, engines, several cat engines, diesel engines, and they have a battery that's tying that all together and providing uh, frequency response reserves and uh, and also modulating the solar and and the generators for when they need to come on. So it's, it was very interesting concept and it, it worked like a dream. Very cool. So determine what technology is going to work best for your location. Wind is not going to work in most areas or a lot of areas, right? Because you you got to be away from an airport. It's tough to permit. You got to have some available land. Solar is going to be limited because you may not have a lot of land, you may have a lot of rooftop space, or you may not have a lot, your rooftop may be cut up with a lot of rooftop units. Uh, so you need to do an assessment of what's my available land to resource, and then work back from there on what, what could go in, right? So uh, target larger facilities. I, I, this is where we see most of the action right now uh, is in hospitals, universities, both of those could be uh, district energy systems as well. Uh, even a standalone hospital is very intriguing at this point from the resiliency standpoint. Manufacturing and agriculture, a lot of agriculture that's out in the middle of nowhere, the sort of the end of the line, they're looking at microgrids. Um, manufacturing, if it's uh, manufacturing key components, that's very critical, can't take any flicker or flash and power reliability is a huge deal. Uh, data centers is another one that I think is gonna be moving in that direction. They need constant power. They cannot take any reliability hits. And nobody wants their, their web browsing to be disrupted. So, uh, and they want you know, security of all their transactions online. So that's one that's not listed on here that I think is gonna become a big one. Uh, and then hospitalities and municipalities. And, Municipalities is an interesting one because we talked about the deferred maintenance issue with wastewater treatment plants previously, and, and it's really kind of at epidemic levels in, in the country, in the U.S. anyway. Uh, there's not been much investment in about the last 30 to 35 years in those facilities, a ton of deferred maintenance, and they're really looking at how they deploy their capital and their resources to solve those problems and upgrade and improve their energy profile as well. Okay, now the all important how, and this is where we're gonna spend some time talking about financing, and this is where the rubber meets the road. Um, so fundamentally, the, the big change in renewables, even in solar, what has been the adoption of financial tools to scale the growth rapidly 
and taken the capital budget issue off the table, right? So if you give the consumer the option of a zero down product, put in and start cash flowing savings now, and I'll pay you for the next you know, 20 years, we found that people are gonna do that, right? A lot of industrial facilities and corporates have a real heartburn at doing deals past about five years. So they're very strategic discussions, but they're not impossible to get done. And finance is, is helping to get those get done earlier than you know three years down the road after they get to the capital budget fist fight. So what types of financial mechanisms exist that you could look to to deploy to get a uh, behind the meter project done? Uh, one would be direct purchase. You know, that's the capital budget decision, either public or private. You've only got so many capital dollars every year. How are you going to spend them and what's the priority, right? So that's a, it's a long process. It's a tedious process and it's, it's multi-year at best, right? Uh, an emerging sector we see right now is, is P3s, public private partnerships. And this is where a, a, a financial investor will come in or a guarantee will, a guarantor will come in with some technology, guarantee the technology is going to work. An investor comes in, places some money in it. And the uh, municipality or the public entity, in this case, maybe a wastewater treatment facility, still owns the facility and operates it, but somebody else is putting money in it in a public-private partnership to get something done that otherwise wouldn't have not gotten done, right? So we're going to talk about an example of that down the road here in a minute. But uh, very prevalent in Canada. Uh, and it's starting to become more prevalent in the U.S. as a way to get deals done, especially in the, the mush sector and, the, and with municipalities and universities and some others. All right, standard lease agreements. Um, you know, the, that's just like you would lease a piece of equipment. You could, you could do a lease contract on something like this. Lease accounting comes into a play, at, and a lot of times it can be treated as a balance sheet item, like a capital lease. So some people like and don't like leases. Some states specifically only allow you to do a lease and not do a power purchase agreement. So it depends on what the state law says. Uh, most states will allow you to lease. Some ex very small handful ex explicitly prevent that from an energy project, but most states will allow you to do a lease. Uh, the operating lease versus the capital lease you know, an operating lease only applies to, to private companies. It does not apply to any, any public entities. Uh, both of these, all of these different financing mechanisms, by the way, except for direct pur uh, purchase, allow a tax investor to get involved and efficiently monetize all the tax benefits. So if you don't have a huge tax ap appetite, which is key to getting the full value out of these things, then doing some sort of financial transaction like this will allow a tax investor to come in and take that for a return on their money and then they'll give you a better deal, right? So uh, that's what all these financial structures really deal with. So a third party ownership, uh, you know, it could be in the form of a power purchase agreement or what we're seeing now is a move towards energy services agreements or managed energy services agreements. And, in, and the power purchase agreement is just a, a we're going to put this system in, you're going to agree to pay us X amount for the power over the life of uh, the term of the deal, which is typically 20 or 25 years. It could be shorter depending on the resource used. Not uncommon to see combined heat and power units go for 10 to 15 years, uh, but it's very common to see solar and wind deals to go 20 or 25 years, right? so behind the meter. Um, and the energy services agreement and the MESAs, which is the managed energy service agreements, can apply to both public or, or private institutions. And those are really emerging. And that's where a, a company will come in and say, almost on a concession agreement, and they'll say, uh, you give me your assets you have on, on hand now, uh, and we're going to put in some additional assets. We're going to guarantee you so much savings over a period of time, and we're going to take over all of your utility spend and manage all of that. And these are the resources we're going to add. And they may they may add a, uh, a solar and an engine, or solar and a battery, or solar wind hybrid, or some other technology behind there. And then they're also going to manage any other energy you're purchasing from your utilities. They will take all that in and manage that. Uh, for a fee. Those are starting to grow in popularity. 
is most businesses want to focus on what they want to do. A hospital wants to treat patients, right? Uh, a manufacturing company wants to produce the widget they're, that they're producing. They're not in the energy business. So they're willing to let somebody come in, help them meet their sustainability objectives with a pragmatic business approach in return for a long-term deal to just take care of all their energy. Okay. Now we're gonna get down to a little example. Um, this is a project that we've been doing uh, in the US and it is at a wastewater treatment plant. And we put a comprehensive set of, set of solutions in place for this facility. We put in, as you can see there on the, the picture in the center is a PV carport that's going in and there's some additional PV that's going in as well. Uh, we put in a cogen unit and a battery and a microgrid controller and so now that facility is uh, burning biogas that it produces off of its treatment. It is producing uh, energy from the sun, right? And it's got a battery that's sitting in the background and sort of balancing those different resources. And it's also providing uh, services to the grid. So this particular one's in California and the California independent system operators got a direct interface. So now not only is that just an energy consumer, it's putting energy frequency and, regu and regulation uh, resources back on the grid, demand response, and uh, providing dispatch services. So when the grid needs it and they can call on this facility, it can be scheduled in and provided to the grid to help the grid out in times of need, right? So it's gone from an energy consumer to a resource for the grid. And it, there's O and M savings that they're realizing out of this, and additional capacity revenues that uh, a typical behind the meter system, uh, if it was just solar PV or a generator, may not have had. Right. So uh, while it's it's not completely isolated behind the utility, it can be shut off and run on island mode. It it is connected, so it can offer those grid resources back to the uh, the front front of the meter from behind the meter. Right. So and capturing that economic value. At this point, I'd like to throw it over for questions and see if we have any. I appreciate everyone's uh, time again this afternoon. Okay, let me take a quick look here. I believe we have one or two in here. Yep, we do. Um, okay. So the first question is, what are some examples of potentially cost-effective technologies to consider for commercial facilities? Does this still apply in a region with mainly heating and lower cooling loads? And that's from Vancouver. Yes, it can, it can apply. And you could look at this for almost any size of building, uh, although I would say you skew towards the larger end. I would look for a facility that's got an energy spend, uh, or let's just talk about in megawatts, peak demand of megawatts. Um, it's got a megawatt or more in peak demand. And I'd say between one and 10 megawatts is, is sort of the, the sweet spot. Uh, and you've got some available land or resources around there that you could exploit, right? And if you don't, if, say if you, you've got a little rooftop PV you could put on, you don't have a ton of land around the building, you could always combine that with a generator and a battery and you're still in the game, right? And, but it all, it's all gonna depend on what your current rate structure is set up like now and what that payback is. Okay. okay. Thank you. Next one is, why is being located in a deregulated electricity market important in terms of being a candidate for on-site generation? Why not facilities in fully regulated jurisdictions? I think it's, a, it's it's applicable to both, right? So if you're in a deregulated market, you have more access to, to shop your power, but you're still subject to the whims of the market, right? And, and when you're buying power from a deregulated third-party supplier, you're buying energy and capacity from them in order to serve your load. Well, if you put in, you have a clear price signal over what those are, from a, from a wholesale energy standpoint, and you also have a signal over what your transmission and distribution costs are. So it's a, it's a little bit different economic analysis in a DREG market than it is in a fully regulated, vertically integrated market, like in the mid, I'm in Minnesota, for instance. So there's no competition here. It's, you buy from your utility, 
um, and it's completely vertically integrated. But there's good opportunities here because if I look at the rate structure behind my utility, I can kind of see what the, well, I know what I'm paying per kilowatt hour, and I know the, what demand charge they're charging me. So I can kind of back into, well, this is kind of what the wholesale market's doing. I know from that, that's my price signal to tell me the economics of my behind the meter project, right? So it's either a go or a no-go based on that price signal from a regulated utility. In a deregulated market, it's a go, no-go based on the combination of your third-party supply options, which are a little bit more liquid, and may change over time, and your, your utility provider as well. So it works for both. Okay, thank you. Next question is um, really for your opinion. It says, what is your perspective on Mexico's future for these topics? On, uh, sorry, it's Mexico? It just, that, that, that it says, what is your perspective on Mexico's future on these topics? Oh, Mexico, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think Mexico is is an area that's that's also ripe for some some change there. Uh, very high rates, electric rates in Mexico, have a recently deregulated market or quasi deregulated -re market, pretty active wholesale market. Um, the other thing I will say this: I'm going to use the Mexico example to talk about dereg versus reg again too. In a deregulated market, it's it's much clearer to understand the value of any power you're selling back or over uh, producing than it is in a regulated market, right? So you have a price signal from the wholesale market on what that power is worth. Where in a regulated market, you really don't. You're capped into whatever the utility's avoided cost is. Uh, and Mexico is sort of in a similar boat. The prices in Mexico are quite high, especially among uh, the, the basic uh, CFE is the main utility down there. Their prices are pretty high. The, the prices in the marketplace are pretty fr are frothy, and they're also pretty high, but there is a price signal. So I think that market is ripe for a lot of behind-the-meter solutions. And there's typically a lot of land down there. So you could put, and there's decent wind resources in some of that part of that country, so you could put a, a wind and solar hybrid with an engine or a battery down there and do quite well. Okay. okay. Yeah. Um, next question is: What can be considered a favorable favorable spark thread? Hmm. Spark thread. That's spreads. really good. That's really going to depend on the, the local economics where you're at, right? So, uh, I looked at one the other day, and you know, the spark spread was was very positive. It was plus ten, right? So. Basically, the price of gas in and the power out was was low price of gas in, highly efficient generation out, and so it made a lot of sense. It was a very efficient unit. But in some cases, you may have regionally, you may have a higher price of gas and maybe a poor, poor or efficient unit. So it depends on the local economics in the area. Okay. Um... What are the potential of utility incentives or rebates in these types of projects? I think they're critical, uh, and it it's all depends on the state. Uh, well, we'll start with the federal. The federal's got the, in the U.S. anyway, it's got the tax incentives uh, that are starting to ramp down. Uh, the wind production tax credit ends this year. The solar investment tax credit uh, starts stepping down from 30% and starts goes down to 10% by 2023, I believe it is. Uh, those are the, the primary federal incentives, and various states have a variety of incentives that are out there, either in rebates or in uh, other uh, tax incentives by state uh, that make them quite attractive, or in renewable energy credit markets, right? So uh, New Jersey, for instance, has, has, has been a historically very solid solar market behind the meter because their SREC, their sol solar renewable energy credit has been well above $200 for quite a while. Washington DC, for instance, is about $350. Uh, Illinois is in the, it's got a, a new program that they've got a guaranteed REC price for about 15 years in the $40 range, right? So you start looking at those kind of state incentives and combine that with the federal incentives. And then you start honing in on states that are very attractive for given resources. 
you're typically going to find the best incentive is going to be for solar. And then you start going down the chain from there. Okay. Um, let's see. Someone asks, can you please explain the difference between a regulated versus an unregulated electricity market? Certainly. Yeah. So in, in let's Pennsylvania, for instance, uh, I say so you have a, a several commercial properties in Pennsylvania. In Pennsylvania, you have a, a utility that's going to transmit and distribute the electrons to you, but you can go out and buy uh, from a third party supplier or a marketer the actual electron. Okay, so uh, I go out to direct energy, I, I commit for a year, I buy the power from them, I maybe shop three or four suppliers, they give me the, the best price, they deliver the electrons to my utility and the utility delivers it to my door, right? That's a deregulated market. In a regulated market where I sit here, I'm in Minnesota, and you know, it's the middle of a bunch of snow, but uh, my only choice as the same size of commercial building operator for my portfolio in Minnesota is to buy from my local utility. They're vertically integrated. They control the transmission and distribution. They own the generation. And so they're providing, providing both the electrons and the capacity and and sending that to me, and they are regulated by the state. So the State Public Utility Commission guarantee they have a monopoly, and so they guarantee them a certain rate of return every year, which is usually 10 to 12 percent, and they set their rates based on that return. So I can't shop, but the state is theoretically protecting me from price gouging by oversight of the regulated utility. Okay. Let's see. What are the opportunities for commercial real estate offices? Owners often have about a five-year holding period horizon. That's a tough one, right? So I just had this conversation yesterday with, uh, with some real estate folks. And, and if you don't have a long-term outlook on a building or a specific property, a behind the meter system is definitely going to encumber that property, right? So if you're going to keep that thing for 15 plus years, then yeah, I think it makes a lot of sense. If you're going to flip it every five years or so and then replace it, you just have to be aware of whatever you put on site and what kind, whatever deal you enter into it, whether it's a pace finance deal, uh, whether it's a third party owned system, when you go to sell that property, you know, what encumbrances go on with that property? Does that complicate the deal, right? So, and then it is a question that's a little tricky and sticky for commercial real estate developers and property managers. Some have been all in on renewable energy on site. Some look at off site, um, but there's no doubt there's an opportunity to turn that building into a resource, but you got to have a long-term view. Five years is tough. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see. Are there pre-engineered microgrid control systems or do they have to be individually designed? There are they are pre there are pre-engineered solutions, yes. And uh, a lot of them are centered around the battery, right? So in the like we'll talk about lithium ion batteries for uh, a minute. Uh, there's about two different lithium ion battery manufacturers in the world. The manage, they manufacture the actual cells, Panasonic, and uh, there's a couple of others. But um, these integrators are buying the cells, packaging them in a container, and they're putting their battery management system on it. And basically, it's a piece of software. And a lot of times, that battery management system is intelligent enough to control all of the other resources. On a solar PV system, for instance, you would have uh, an inverter. And if it's a smart inverter, it could probably do some of that as well, right? But there are off-the-shelf packaged control solutions specific to microgrids that you could purchase. Okay. Uh, let's see. Um, someone asks, what do you think about the Tesla battery pack to store power and sell back on peak? 
I, I think the Tesla battery pack, as well as most of the other battery packs out there, are tremendous. And uh, I think the the uh, they just came out with their mega pack. I think they call it for more utility scale stuff. I think it's 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 great. I I think they they all have their pluses and minuses, but batteries are only going to increase uh, as we go down the road here. Uh, whether it's Tesla, whether it's Tes Volt, whether it's GE, um, you know, it's you're going to see a huge proliferation of batteries. And I I think the flexibility a battery gives you in these systems, either a standalone battery or coupled with behind the meter systems is huge. And where they make sense, where a lithium ion battery, like a Tesla battery makes sense is if, is if you have very spiky loads, right? So if, you're, if your demand is very spiky throughout the day, if you have a very steady, uh, say you a manufacturing load 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and it doesn't move much, right? A battery's not gonna do you a whole lot of good on price arbitrage, where you have a lot of spikiness, and then I'll use the uh, commercial buildings as a good example, right? So people come in in the morning, they do their work, then they, they leave in, in the evening or at late afternoon, and then the building kind of cycles down, and it's definitely low on the weekend. That kind of a pattern makes a lot of sense for lithium ion, especially if the, uh, to clip the peaks off there. Sorry, I was muted there. Um, how do we estimate the cost of a microgrid system? PV costs are almost certain, but to set up the control and the storage fees. Yeah, so the the only way to estimate that is to get a hold of a, a decent developer or you know, like a GE or any developer that's in that space and have them price one up to you. Microgrids are extremely customized to your specific location and operating conditions, right? So there's not a really an off the shelf solution there on a microgrid basis. Okay. Do you see solar thermal with storage or biofuel as a better alternative energy source? I, I don't know about solar thermal. I think what could be interesting uh, is solar to hydrogen, uh, especially in, in larger applications. I think that's got some particular interest to me because it, it allows you to then also gives you a storage advantage and arbitrage there as well. Uh, could be wind to hydrogen as well. Uh, solar thermal is a technology that's not got a lot of scale yet. Uh, and I'm not sure, I'm just not sure about the technologies. Uh, it's a good technology. I'm not sure how scalable it is. I think the hydrogen angle is more interesting. Okay, next, let me see. How will or is California's push to get away from natural gas usage going to affect cogeneration potential in the state? Could this push growth to other areas around the country? It absolutely could. Yeah, I think you're already seeing it. Um, you know, the, the city of Berkeley in California, for instance, is any new building built there has got to be a non gas consuming building. Uh, a lot of pressure on a lot of communities in other parts of the state as well. The city of New York basically is, uh, wants to go without gas. There's a, in the Northeast, there's a number of moratoriums on new gas connections with utilities. Um, gas is, is in the crosshairs, right? So cogen definitely is right there. Now you can make the argument that putting in a cogen system and, and running it with biogas is a lot more interesting uh, than just running it with natural gas, right? Cause then you're, the biogenic cycle of that is is a heck of a lot less impact than just burning that gas. Now you're still combusting methane, right? But uh, the total carbon footprint of that is is a lot less. I think you're going to see a lot more cogen in the next five to ten years uh, until we reach the point where you know hydrogen starts to come in and take over some of that stuff. If hydrogen ramps up, I, I think. Hydrogen is the answer to heavy industry if we can get it scalable and safe. Uh, and heavy industry uses a lot of that gas, right? So fertilizer and a lot of these guys, uh, refineries, a lot of that's, that gas is their, their feedstock, right? So uh, we got to figure out a solution for that. We figured out a solution on the electric side at scale to reduce our, our CO2 footprint. The next thing is how do we solve for gas? And 
code generation is right in there. But again, code generation with biogas, I think, has got is much more interesting future. Thank you. Um, just want to let you all know that we are at our one hour mark and we were scheduled for an hour. We will continue to go for just a few more minutes to keep answering the questions that are in here while we still have a few more minutes. Um, but I do want to let you know that if you were scheduled for just an hour and you need to drop off, just please be aware you may go ahead and do that. You will receive a follow up email with a link to the recording. So feel free to drop off if you want to. Feel free to stay on and we will address as many of the questions as we can in about the next 10 minutes. Um, says, what happens when private companies realize that operating leases will be on balance sheet, i.e. impact to their current ratios, credit ratings, etc.? Yeah, I think they're already there. Um, that's that's why it's sometimes harder to get a lease done uh, than a PPA. Uh, it, but there's some areas that won't allow you to do a PPA. Some states ex expressly prohibit a power purchase agreement and force the lease. So uh, you've got to get the accounting treatment. You've got to get the finance folks and the accounting folks comfortable with whatever approach you're taking on the front end of these uh, to understand the, the full ramifications of a finance deal. Right, so then maybe you default back to capital budget dollars, but that's a tough argument, right? There's only so much money to go around, and if you're in the business of taking care of patients, where's your money going to go? It's going to go to taking care of patients, right? So um, I think you're going to see, I think the finance sector will also respond in kind uh, at some point, and you'll see some creative deal structures put in place to, to keep these off balance sheet. I firmly believe that. Okay, so next, are there ways to protect ourselves from changes to net metering rule changes where we no longer, where we have longer payback windows? Sorry. Yes, put in a microgrid and don't export. <laughs> that's that's <laughs> kind of a flippant response, but uh, no, it's uh, if if you if you're not exporting a lot of power and you have a balanced system behind the meter that will follow your load. And reduce your 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 impact your net metering impact, then you're going to be a lot better off. Net metering is nothing more than a battery. It's just the utility operating as the battery in this case and paying you uh, a little something for your trouble, right? So there is value to that energy that the utility is using, but the utilities don't like it because it is competitive to them. So they're going to play all kinds of games with it. And so the answer at the end of the day is resources behind the meter that follow your load in a microgrid or some other similar type of structure. Thank you. Now we do have a few questions asking about costs here. So um, let me see. What are the average costs of these solutions like dollars per megawatt across solar, CHP, et cetera? Well, let's just talk about, uh, let's talk about about a five megawatt system in California on a microgrid basis is about $18 million, 18 to $20 million. Very rough estimate. Um, I would say on a, on a per watt basis behind the meter, you could get solar installed from $1.75 to $1.50. Uh, and then you just go up from there. You know, wind is more capital intensive, but it's going to be rare that you're going to be able to get that in. Um, a cogen unit, you're, you're looking at probably less than a dollar uh, a watt on a compare, if you're comparing to a solar project. So if you're gonna put an engine in, you could do it for maybe 70 cents a watt and solar $1.50, $1.75 a watt. And then you'd have a control system uh, to go on top of that, which is probably you know another 30 to $50,000 and then you know, ballast plant, so. That's sort of some rough numbers. Okay, next, let me find. Um, how do you feel about the elevated amount of carbon dioxide production along with all the other harmful chemicals that are released while mining for the metals used in batteries? Uh, I don't like it uh, at all, right? But uh, I also don't like, uh, you know, coal plants uh, in the district energy system in downtown Louisville next to a children's hospital, right? So 
uh, there's got to be a trade-off somewhere and, and you know life is about trade-offs and the functionality of a battery and the energy they can save and the benefits it can provide are worth it to me in my opinion Okay, let's see. Let me just. Um, commercial real estate sometimes is you sometimes uses capitalization rate to justify property value. Have you seen firms use on-site generation to improve capitalization rate and thus justify higher property value at resale to recover the cost of installation? Uh, I have not expressly witnessed it, but I've had those discussions with property folks. Right, the cap rate is huge in that area. And the other metric they look at is net operating income, right? So uh, if, if they reduce their cost, that's an increase in their net operating income, which then affects their cap rate. So it's all kind of interlinked. But yes, they're, they're definitely considering those things. Okay, what is the best mix in an African region? Hmm, that is an excellent question. Uh, well, I would start with solar. And I depending on what their wind, re if they're by the coast, I and mean, there may be some wind resource there, a lot of diesel generation down in that part of the world. And I would think that uh, you could couple, most peaking diesel generation can be taken over by solar and a battery, right? Um, so I would look at solar and a battery first and uh, then branch out from there. Okay. Um... Outside of demand response and frequency response, what other commercial options does one have to ensure faster or higher project returns? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, well, you could also, you know, the value of the energy is also potentially there for any, now, depends on the state, the PURPA rates, the PURPA rules, and the avoided cost rate uh, that you get for selling the energy. Uh, but if it, it's designed correctly, you're not going to have a lot of exports, but you are going to provide those other resources like frequency and uh, if it's if it's a generator, you know, synchronous regulation, uh, if it's uh, PV based, it's going to be inverter based power factor correction, reactive power. Yeah, those are the, those are the main ones. Okay, um, I'm probably going to make this the last question. If you proceed with a natural gas hybrid solution, do you recommend locking in multi-year natural gas pricing to protect from rising energy costs? Um, it says supply and demand is pushing coal-based regions to switch to natural gas. Yes, yeah, I, and it, the good thing about the natural gas market is it's extremely liquid and there's a lot of tools to, to hedge your price risk there. The other thing I would do heavily is I would look for a source of biogas and enter into a long-term 10 plus year deal. So you know exactly what you're paying over a long-term period of time. And it was, you know, biogenic. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So, um, I'm just going to go on with a couple of quick announcements here. Just to let everybody know that training for the US for 2020 is available for, it's open, it's online, it's so ready for registration. So please take a look at the website and see if there's anything there for you. Um, we have our four events scheduled for next year also. You can see those on your screen right now. Um, and East is the, the one that's coming up fastest. Let me just go back to that previous one so you can see that again. Um, we have East in April, West in June, world in September and Europe in October. East in April, registration online is, is open as it is for the, the others too, but um, there is early bird pricing for this one until January 1st of $95 for AEE members. And your next AEE member webinar will take place next week on Thursday at the same time. Um, and we have a, a panel of three speakers next week for energy policy, innovation, and its impact on carbon reduction offshore wind. So I hope that many of you will join us for that. But I did want to say that as always, we will follow up um, with an email within the next 24 to 48 hours. We'll give you a certificate of attendance for today's webinar and a link to the recording. Um, thank you all for listening in today. And thank you, Mr. Griffey, for your time and expertise and for sharing that with our AE members today. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. And bye for now.